Greetings, and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, we will continue the Sister Soldier Saga via this fifth volume entitled Midnight, a Gangster Love Story. We mean no offense, but we're going to let the reading commence. Chapter 19 Later, I was sitting at the top of the entrance at Pratt, uninvited, waiting to see Akami, even if it would be only for a moment. I knew I wouldn't see her Friday after work because of the league. I knew I wouldn't see her Saturday because of agreeing to meet Amir, Chris, Redbone, and them. It had already been two weeks since me and Akami enjoyed going out together. I wondered if she was missing me like I was missing her. She showed up climbing the cement stairs slowly, wearing jeans, dark brown leather nikes, and a tapered dark brown windbreaker with a matching bandana pulled tightly across her forehead like a gorgeous Cherokee squaw showcasing her dark eyes. She had two long brown leather tibular cases strapped and crisscrossing on her back. On closer inspection, I could see from the red and green stripes on her leather cases that they were designed by Gucci. She looked like she was headed to an archery expedition, her bow and arrow strapped behind her. I realized that she was carrying her artwork inside her leather tubes. 
As I watched her, she seemed trapped somewhere in her own thoughts. In that short space of time, I wondered what she was thinking. I wondered how it was going with her aunt and uncle. When she looked up and realized it was me waiting there, her smile lit up so bright it cut through the evening dusk. She locked her eyes into mine. No translation needed. I stood and held my hand out to assist her up the last step. She never let it go. We walked hand in hand like that toward her class. I didn't know what my next move would be. I had suspended my thoughts and was moving only on feelings. Something completely new for me. Down the hall from her class, I pulled out a piece of paper and wrote out my telephone number, then handed it to her. Arigato. She ripped the paper in half and wrote her telephone number on her half, then handed it to me. I felt foolish, standing there with no words, in the middle of a storm of energy, moving back and forth between us. When more and more students brushed by, I placed my hands on the shoulders and spun her around in the direction of her classroom. She spun back around to face me and threw up the call me sign using her two fingers, the pinky and the thumb. Hi, I said agreeing. We both laughed a little, then we both turned to leave at the same time. It was even crazier when she called me late that same night. I picked up the telephone in my room. Instantly, I recognized the rhythm of her breathing and her seductive silence. She didn't say nothing, so I didn't either. She started to breathe a little harder, then laughed lightly. Then I laughed too. After all, what did I expect by giving her my telephone number? Even when she called, we didn't have a common language to speak. Please was all she said. Then click, she hung up. I called her back. Her telephone line was busy. I hung up. Four minutes later, my telephone rang again. It was her Japanese cousin with her American accent. Akimi asked me to call you for her, she said, speaking in a low tone like she didn't want anyone on her end to overhear her. I'm sorry, I know it's late, but Akimi has no sense of time. She'll stay up all night drawing and painting and forgetting about how us normal people live, she said, sounding a little embarrassed. It's I. Most of the time, I'm up late too, I told her. She took a deep breath. So I guess the two of you have become friends, she stated. I don't know why I didn't like her way of choosing her words. Friends is all I answered back. Okay, good. Well, anyway, Akimi wanted me to tell you that she won't be working at Uncle's store this weekend. She has to finish up her midterm art projects. She wants to know if you and she can meet up instead on the following week on Wednesday at 2 p.m.? She didn't wait for my response. She started talking real fast and answering her own questions. I told Akimi that you probably couldn't meet her then because you'll be at school on Wednesday at 2 p.m., right? She asked and suggested at the same time. Tell Akami Wednesday at 2 is cool. I'll pick her up at your uncle's store. Um, wait a minute, no. Meet her at the bakery like the last time you saw her. She said, assuming that the last time at the bakery was the last time I had seen Akami. I could tell now that Akami didn't tell her cousin everything. Wednesday at 2 at the bakery, I. I agreed. Oh, so you're on spring break next week, too? Her cousin asked, still digging. I didn't know if New York public schools are closed, but Akimi's college is closed, and New York public schools are closed, too. She waited for me to tell her my business. I flipped it around on her and began questioning her instead. I thought you said Akimi is 16, a high school student like us, I asked. She is 16. She attends the art college on a scholarship, Monday through Thursday in the evenings, and helps out aunt and uncle at their store on the weekends. She won a nationwide art competition in Japan. One year at an American art college was the top prize. That's why she's here in the U.S. It's her first time. You know, it's a very demanding program. Akimi really doesn't have a lot of free time. The cousin continued to meddle. 
You have an American accent, I said to the cousin to hear her reaction. Yes, thank you for the compliment. She answered like I figured she would. Why don't you teach Akemi how to speak English? I asked, putting the pressure back on her. Akemi does whatever she wants to. Maybe now that the two of you are friends, she'll learn to speak English. The cousin answered strangely and defensively. Listen, back home in Japan, we are all required to learn English in school, but not Akemi. Her and her father make all of their own rules. Akemi speaks Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and Thai. That's it. No English. She laughed as though speaking four major languages was nothing if English wasn't one of them. She sounded like Uma's father, northern grandfather. He used to say, English is the language of money. No English, no money. The cousin continued talking, seeming to enjoy the attention being switched to her. My family moved from Japan to the States when I was six years old. My parents and my brothers, we are all fluent. Everyone except my mother's mother. She refuses to learn English too, the cousin said, looking down on her grandmother's choice. So, Akami's mother and your mother are sisters, I asked her. No, Akami's mother is dead. She was North Korean. Akami's father and my father and uncle at the store are all brothers. Uncle just came to the U.S. two years ago. Akami's father has never been to the U.S. He is big, big business in Japan. Way too busy, she said proudly. She had breezed by the statement, Akami's mother is dead. Just like the Americans breezed by heavy and serious and sacred topics with an ease I was unfamiliar with and could not understand as a Sudanese. As the cousin continued speaking, I was stuck back there. It must be terrible to be motherless, I thought. It must be a loneliness that no one but a motherless child could understand, really. My world without Uma would be a world without sunlight or heat, without moonlight or music, without reason or love. It would be a cold place with no seasons, filled with complete darkness, no stars and no nothing. A strange sensation flashed over me. It felt like I had blacked out for a minute. He never remarried Akami's father. He is elder brother and Akami is his only child. She was saying when I came back to listening to her. Only child, I thought. No mother, brothers or sisters. More loneliness. Okay, Wednesday at two at the bakery, I said abruptly, cutting her off. Oh. She said. Okay. Like her feelings were hurt. Thank you for calling me for Akami, I said, hanging up. Chapter 20 Me, Amir, and Chris were seated on the gym floor with the rest of the cats who made the cut. Like everybody else, we wanted to hear how the competition was going down and what the stakes were. Tyreek and his boys, who stood solidly behind him, got straight down to business. Who provides the recreation in our hoods? Tyreek started off asking us questions. We, the players, was just kicked back, leaning on our elbows. One cat balancing his head on a basketball, another spinning a basketball on his finger, just looking at one another, wondering if anybody knew what he was really asking us. No one said sh**. All of you are right. The answer is, nobody provides the recreation in our hoods. He looked around to assess the effect of his words. If you young motherfuckers were not all sitting right here tonight, your asses would be outside doing nothing. I need y'all to remember that. Remember that we are doing something that no one else is doing for your black asses. Remember that when the stands are full and the parks are packed and everybody is watching and cheering for you. Don't lose your head. Remember who checked for you. Who made it all possible. Everybody in here got on Nikes. Is Nike running this sh**? Is Nike running this league? 
Does Nike give a f what a half a million n are doing on a Friday night in Brooklyn? Count it up. If you can count, he said. Him and his boys laughed. 125 youth in here, including us up here in the front, paid at least a hundred for a pair of these joints. That's $12,500 worth of footwear in this room alone. And you know, Brooklyn gotta stay fresh. So us in this room altogether will spend at least $12,500 a month on kicks. That's $150,000 a year just for us in this room. Outside on the streets, at least 85% of Brooklyn youth, male and female, are rocking Nikes. Yeah, I know. Some paper also gets spent on Reebok for your girls and on Adidas. For Nike, that's half a million youth times $12,500 a month. In Brooklyn alone. How much is that in a year? Who can add that up? That's seventy-five billion dollars, I answered in the silent gym. My man, Tyreek shouted, giving me my props. What's one percent of seventy-five billion dollars? Seven hundred fifty million, I answered again. Are the rest of you listening? He asked the players. Nah, y'all ain't listening. Cause the numbers we talking. You don't even think about this is 100% loyal to Nike, Reebok, Adidas, Puma, all of them. But we can't get 1% return on our loyalty. You can't get none of these companies to put up even 50,000 stinky, measly dollars to run this league, buy us some uniforms, donate some surplus sneakers, and a couple of balls. So remember who is right here in the hood with you, spending paper, making it happen, giving you something to do before you get a chance to kill each other. One kid started clapping, then all the cats started clapping, then cheering and clapping. Be grateful, Tyreek continued. I hope not one of you is here looking to get something for nothing. You gotta work to earn. You gotta train to win. You gotta go hard and play hard, got it? Tyreek ended his pitch. He looked like he was feeling pretty good about himself. I'm looking beyond the hype of his words, wondering if this meant the league was bankrupt and we wasn't getting paid ish. Then he laid out the incentives. $10,000 each for the first place team's five starting players. Bench riders get gift certificates for the Wiz, an electronic store. Next, 2000 each for the second place team's five starting players. Bench riders get Foot Locker gift certificates. The most valuable player of this youth league gets 25000 a custom-made diamond ring, and bragging rights in every hood in the New York area. For losing, you get the same thing you get for losing in life. Nothing! The players cracked up. We got no space or time for bullshit. Tyreek announced, then he paced the gym floor, laying out the youth league rules. He started off with their code of silence, quote-unquote. He said, since Nike gets our loyalty for free, we should at least let the league have it for the price of the prizes. The business of the league was confidential. He said any player who told anybody outside of the league anything about the business of the league, money changing hands and whatnot, would forfeit his winnings and position on the team. Don't ask us how we'll find out if you've been running your mouth. We just do. And when we do, there won't be no lawyers or trials, if you know what I mean. And don't think that if you're one of the losers, that you got nothing to lose. You always have your life, Tyreek threatened. His words 
brought on a serious silence. When he felt the fear had sunk in enough, he laughed it off. But we all know he wasn't joking. When he broke all of us down into ten teams of twelve players each, we were seated into new groups on the gym floor. Some guys' faces were tight with the team choices, crews being broken up and different kids from different areas of Brooklyn being mixed in together, friends being divided, enemies being united. This is business, Tyreek said, cut and dry, responding to the tight looks. He handed out each team's schedules for practices, scrimmages, and game times, dates, and locations. Each team got assigned a color instead of a team name. Needless to say, he had everybody's full attention and cooperation. One of Tyreek's boys was assigned to each team. We now found out they were actually our team coaches. The cat who came my way was named Vega, wearing a red puma track suit, a crisp white tee, a cropped S curl, and red suede pumas. He was swift and light on his feet and broad-chested, like he had a committed daily workout. He squatted, signaled us all to squat, and spoke softly, so we had to strain to hear his words. You're looking at the winning squad right here, he told us. I could feel it. He scanned our faces like he wanted our instant trust. There's only one way to take control of this thing, and that's this right here. He placed his hand over his heart. Do you n****s got the heart? He asked. We all stared right back at him, but nobody said nothing. Listen, I got tickets to the St. John's College Ball game tomorrow night at Madison Square Garden. This is the hot ticket. The Big Eastern Championship joints. He pulled the tickets halfway out and pushed them back into his jacket pocket. I want all of you to meet me right outside the garden in front of Roy Rogers tomorrow night at 6.30. If you late, you f***ed up. I need y'all to see how these players hustle so you'll know what we need to do to handle this business. Don't bring no f***ing body with you. I don't give a f*** who it is. From this night forward, we the team. Anybody ain't seated in this circle right here tonight. Don't need to know and don't count. You got it? He held out his hand. Everybody gave him a pound. He introduced himself, unfolded a sheet of paper from his pocket, and tried to match players' names with their faces. It was almost 11 p.m. when we 120 ball players got out of there. We walked out calmly, no crowd or music or drama like last time. Probably each one of us was still spinning the dollar numbers around in our heads and wondering if it was real or not. I couldn't front. Vega didn't seem like a coach, but he got me open with those tickets. I had never been inside Madison Square Garden, although I walked right past it often. Of course I've seen it on TV the world-famous home of the New York Knicks. Back in the Sudan, at my father's apartment in Khartoum, we watched her games a couple of times on my father's satellite television. My father even had an autographed ball by old-school point guard Walt Frazier. Now my blood was pumping at the thought of checking out the championship game. The police were circling the area of the high school gym like sharks waiting for an easy kill. It was a reminder to all us black youth that we were born suspects. But for once, wasn't nothing jumping off with us teens. Cliques were regrouped and formed up and all walked off quietly in almost every direction. Tonight I could see that when somebody finally stops playing and starts talking real business opportunity to some young black men, all that rowdy sh** goes right out the window. We three hung back a minute while everything cleared up. As soon as we went to push off, the girl with the dimples popped up out of the dark, walking swiftly toward us. She waved her hand with excitement. Hey, Star! She called out. All of us laughed. As she came into view, I saw she had a t-shirt on that said, Midnight, in bold, dark blue letters across her breasts. Where are the rest of your girls? Almir asked her right away. 
She didn't even look at him when she answered. She just said, I don't really be with them like that. Amir caught her intent. Anyway, I waited so long for you to call me. I got in trouble. I wouldn't let anyone in my house use the phone. I kept telling him, he's gonna call, he's gonna call, he's gonna call. What happened? Did you lose my number? She asked, smiling, full of energy, rocking back and forth on her feet like there was no way for her to keep still. Nah, I answered. Nah, what? She asked. Nah, I didn't lose your number, I said. All right, superstar, she said in a joking way. I smiled at her style. She had a nice complexion with smooth skin. Her hair was shining from the gel she used to swirl out her bangs. God, you got perfect teeth, she said after I smiled. I really didn't know what to do with her comments. She seemed to say whatever was on her mind. She didn't give a f*** that my two friends were hearing her every word. I'm not going to worry about it. You'll call me. I know it, she said. I got to run. I got one minute before my grandmother locks the door on me. She turned on her Nikes and ran full speed in her denim miniskirt, leaving Amir and Chris doing double takes. I think you need to call her, man, Amir said. Him and Chris laughed. What y'all think about the money? Chris asked. Do you think the winners will really get paid like that brother Tariq said? Well, if they don't pay out, what the f*** can anybody do about it? The hustlers are the sponsors. Who's gonna go to war with them? Amir asked. I think they'll pay out. I got a feeling about it, I told them. What kind of feeling? Chris asked. You know, we thinking that it's all about basketball, but they gotta have something riding on it too. Otherwise, why would they do it? Something like what? Amir asked. It could be anything. You see how they cut the groups into teams and gave every team a color? I asked. So? Chris asked. At least in the NBA, you know who the f*** you're working for. You got uniforms, your uniforms got colors, but you know who owns the team, who manages the team, and who you running for. In this league, we can't see who's behind it. Tyreek is the front man, but who does he report to? I try to get them to look at all the angles. If you believe they'll pay out to the champions, none of that sh** even matters. We're running for the money. That's it, Amir said. But we all on different teams, Chris said. Amir's on the red, and you on the black. I'm on the green, he pointed out. It don't matter, I told Chris. It just increases our chances of winning. Whichever one of us wins some paper, we cut it three ways, no matter what happens. That's what up, I said. You're right, that is what up, Amir agreed with me. Oh yeah, I can't do the date thing with homegirl tomorrow night. My team got tomorrow evening on the schedule. It looks like if y'all still want to do it, I'ma have to do it on a weeknight, maybe a Thursday evening, when we ain't at the dojo. Thursday evening, Chris repeated. That's why. But we'll do it. Girls are good on any night, he said. At the train station, we went our separate ways. On the ride home, I kept breaking the basketball situation into separate puzzle pieces. Amir was right. It is all about the money. And if I could get my hands on a chunk of money like that, even after we cut it up, I could match Uma's effort and speed up our move out of Death Valley, Brooklyn, into an even better house in a peaceful and safe place for her and Naja. At the same time, I kept wondering what exactly the hustlers get out of it. Maybe it was a war over territory battled out on the court. Maybe it was all about ticket sales, concessions, or merchandising. Maybe it was a bet in front. Maybe it was just a good ass distraction from what the f was really going on. After a while, I wondered if I was just thinking too hard. Maybe the hustlers was just some n****s with money to burn who came up with a main attraction for Brooklyn cats to pile up at while they showcased their whips, jewels, and bitches. Chapter 21 Seemed like half of New York was outside Madison Square Garden trying to get in. The New York City evening air was more cool than cold as spring approached, but some degrees hotter around the garden where people gathered. I took careful steps in my clocks. I didn't want dog shit smashed into the grooves of my new souls. 
I didn't want none of these over-eager cats accidentally stepping on my new shoes. It wasn't hard to spot Vega. He was rocking a red Kango and red suede ballys, black slacks, and a red dress shirt. The whole team and the coach had fresh cuts, including me. I could smell the scents of coconut oil and Afro sheen and a strong cologne that I wouldn't wear cutting through the odors of grime, gum, and piss on the New York pavement. But the bright and colorful lights prowled from the garden, the rest rushing to shop at Macy's, made us forget any foul smells and made this the place to be. Besides, tonight we weren't outsiders. We were ticket holders. Vega greeted each Brooklyn teen in our crew as they arrived with a handshake and a swift survey of what they was wearing, saying only two words, nice, nice. He pinched a jute and burlap material on my tan dress shirt and said, I like that. Vega used his eyes to keep a silent headcount going. Every few seconds, he checked his Hamilton watch. When the second hand hit the 30 mark, the last team showed up. Vega waved for us all to follow his lead. We ended up where the rest of the garden crowd wasn't. We were at the VIP entrance to the garden, where the college ball players were arriving in droves. There was a stream of Syracuse University players over six feet tall easily, like it was nothing to it. They climbed down from polished trucks and up out of new whips. We Brooklyn teens was all watching what they was wearing on their bodies and their feet. We even checked the gym bags they carried. Some by Nike, by Adidas, Puma, and whatnot. Vega watched us watching them and said casually, And they say there is no money in college ball. Yeah, right. Three black vans filled with St. John's players, coaches, and personnel pulled up. These cats poured out of the van singing, giving each other pounds, waving at the crowd, and giving the small gathering of spectators a show. I liked the way it seemed like those players had a strong camaraderie and spirit. One team, one goal. Dudes from my hood wasn't like that. See what I was telling you? You have to want it. Those niggas right there want it. And tonight, they're going to take it, Vega said, getting caught up in their hype. I never seen so many people packed in one place before. There was mad energy and excitement. Not one seat was empty except when somebody ran to the bathroom. Can't front. Quite naturally, I started counting the black faces in this huge crowd. Most of the black faces were actually the ball players for Syracuse and St. John's. Otherwise, there were small handfuls of black sprinkled here and there up against a sea of white fans who were pumped up like their lives depended on it. The food vendors began weaving in and out of each of hundreds of rows with their Cokes, Franks, Peanuts, Popcorn, T-shirts, and Team Flags. We Brooklyn teens had good seats, not on the floor, but close enough to it. The twelve of us plus our coach dominated our row. We remained standing, though. We were too excited by the newness of being on the inside. Besides... There was about 15 girls flaunting their blue and orange panties, cheering for their players. Everything moving caught my eye. The way the players were being introduced over the powerful speaker system. Their names and jersey numbers announced with pride, then echoing around the crowd of 25,000 cheering fans. I watched the way each player reacted differently, some soaking up the downpour of admiration, others playing it down, some looking up at themselves as the cameras caught them in a candid close-up and projected their faces onto the mega screen above the scoreboard, some looking anxious to get the game going. I felt that anxiety. Just the strength of the lights shining down on the flawless, triple-polished court, the unripped new white nets and undented rims got me amped. I imagined myself down there, playing on that court for the love of the game. Maybe my entire team was thinking the same thing. 
Maybe that's exactly what Vega wanted us to be thinking. Well, if it was what he wanted, it was a smart plan. And these tickets must have sent him back some. I saw scalpers hawking less expensive seats than we had for more than a hundred dollars. It didn't matter who any of us was rooting for. Vega was rooting for St. John's, so if we thought anything different, we better had kept it to ourselves. He watched the game like he had money on it. The drawback was, when the first half was over, his team was losing by 13 points. Don't sleep, Vega said. Get ready for the big comeback. He was talking to each of us, the strangers on his new team. But it was as if his voice wasn't mic'd up to the ball player's earpieces, cause just when he called it out, they burst out with a new setup, new confidence, and an unbreakable fury. For 16 straight minutes, they flipped the pressure on those Syracuse boys and all hell broke loose when St. John's player Ron Rowan pulled up and hit a 14-foot jumper with only 8 seconds remaining in the game, bringing St. John's to a 1-point lead over Syracuse. While everybody went wild, Vega stood cool, chanting, Eight seconds, eight seconds, it ain't over, keep the pressure on, defense, defense! Syracuse player Dwayne Washington must have felt the same about the remaining eight seconds and the possibilities it left open. Washington drove to the basket with only three seconds left and was so sure his shot was on the money, he started celebrating before his feet touched the polished floor. Just when him and his Syracuse boys thought they had it hemmed, St. John's player Walter Berry unveiled his wingspan and blocked the shot. The buzzer sounded. St. John's took it. The Big Eastern Championship. 70 to 69. While our section of the garden cheered and jumped and bumped one another, I stood still, thinking, here is one thing that I'm real good at. This game is completely legal. And everywhere in America, the whole country thinks it's okay for a young man to play ball. You can't get arrested for it. You can get paid and win props. You can get into a position to buy your mom's a house, no problem, and save the family you love while doing something that you love to do. Vega told us to hang back while the crowd spilled out into the aisles, into the corridors, and out of the building. Soon enough, we were on the train together, heading further uptown to get something to eat at a venue Vega chose. On the train, each of us remained standing once again, leaving the seats for other tired passengers. I don't think any of the 13 of us was scheming on any of the riders that night. We were all just thinking, hoping, dreaming that this night will work out in our favor and eventually put some paper into our pockets. Our late night dinner was at a spot on 175th Street and Broadway named... Malecons. Whole chickens were roasting in their wide windows. The streets surrounding the place were lit up now at 11.10 p.m., same as if it was early evening. The streets were packed with youths, adults, and even babies being pushed in carriages. Inside, the restaurant was popping, almost completely filled. There was still a line of people, plus more, arriving to begin ordering dinner at this late hour. Our table must have been reserved, I thought. There were six small tables pushed together, six chairs on each side, and one at the head. I took the corner chair by the side window. Almost immediately, I noticed that the same buttermilk Porsche with the buttercream leather interior and the gold piping. It was parked on the side block. Brooklyn heads were pressed against Manhattan menus. Only a couple of them tried to find out from Vega what some of the Spanish words on the menu meant so they could get their food orders right. Not focusing on the menus, I was scanning the restaurant. My eyes landed on one group of nine well-dressed young cats, probably in their 20s or late 20s. 
I could tell each of them had a different status by the quality of their jewels and clothing. Only one of them wore a Rolex. He was rocking a 24 karat gold 36 inch chain with a unique piece, a solid gold baby shoe. I realized immediately I had seen it once before. He was a top quality cat. He was definitely the only one in the restaurant wearing a cashmere dress shirt and diamond cufflinks. I glanced down at his Gucci suede driving shoes. Top grade, I thought to myself. You gonna order, man? One of the players asked me. I looked up at the 30-something-year-old Boricua waitress stuffed in a tight dress, smiling down on me with her pad in her hand and pencil ready. I'll take a mofongo with chicken, I ordered and pulled out my $20 and laid it on the table. I got the team tonight, Vega informed me. Put your money away, it's no good here. I held the 20 up towards the smiling waitress and said, Just add this to your tip. Vega smiled quick and nodded. Aight, aight. The waitress folded the bill, slid it in between her breasts, and left, smiling and rushing to place our team's big order. Instantly, Coach went around the table trying to recall each Brooklyn team's name from memory. He messed up right away and called one of our team members Mateo instead of Michael. The guys laughed at his mistakes. Who could do better? You m****s don't even know each other's names, Vega challenged. He laughed a little and pulled out a $20 bill and said, Here goes 20 for whoever can call out the names of every team member, no mistakes. Two players tried and failed immediately, causing everybody to crack up. Neither one of them knew my name, cause up until now, I never said nothing, never signed nothing. For some reason, Vega turned toward me and said, How about you? Go ahead, give it a shot. Panama Black, I pointed out first. I remember his name cause he was black like me and wore two gold framed teeth in the front of his mouth. Machete, I called out second, cause who's gonna forget a dude named after a deadly weapon? Jaguar, I called out next. I remembered his name because I was always intrigued by people who named themselves after animals. My father named his friends and enemies after certain animals when telling a story, a technique he learned from Southern Grandfather. Whichever type of animal a guy picked to name himself after, I was sure it told something about his ways and personality. Braz, I called out next. I heard him speaking on the payphone once right before our last basketball meeting started. He was speaking Portuguese, and that caught my attention. I wondered if he was from Angola or Brazil. I called off all 11 team members' names easily, ending with my own. Midnight, I introduced myself. I lifted his $20 bill off the table. A couple of guys clapped two times for me and gave me my props. Next thing I know, Vega is telling the player, Panama, seated right next to me to switch seats with him. As the waitress delivered some of the food orders, the new coach sat on my side. Eventually, Vega said to me quietly, I see you got it. I didn't know what he meant. You want your $20 back? I asked him, figuring he was a sore loser like the cats on my block who fight and bust shots after losing the dice game. No, you want it fair square, he said. But let me tell you something, he said with a slight Spanish accent slipping into his black English. Always remember to make me look good. I take this shit personal. I didn't answer back nothing because I didn't know what he was talking about. I ate my food quietly and so did he. While the other players' conversations grew louder and louder, I watched the sharp cat with the Rolex on the other side of the restaurant signal to Vega. Vega saw the signal then looked towards the restaurant door. Another cat entered the place carrying a bunch of Foot Locker shopping bags. At one in the morning, we were all standing on an outdoor Brooklyn ball court. Vega threw every team member who complained about playing ball in their dress-up clothes a new pair of shorts and sneakers from the Foot Locker bags. Did you niggas think you was on vacation? He asked the team with a new seriousness. You don't ever get something for nothing. It's time to earn it. I wasn't mad. 
This is around the time I would normally be hooping it out on my own. Now we were divided into two squads. I went on and played it like I was on St. John's. We had 24,989 fewer fans, but I could see the nine well-dressed cats from the dinner spot standing outside the fence. Their cars shined up and double-parked talking among themselves. When I pulled up to take a jumper, I told myself, if this one goes in, the light-skinned cat with the Porsche, Rolex, and diamond cufflinks is the boss. I sank it. It was all net. Heading home at 2.30 a.m., coach and ball players on the train, the real hustlers riding in their cars, Vega asked me, How did you do that? Do what? I asked him. Remember all those names, he said. I could see my little $20 triumph was still f***ing with his head. Did you know some of the guys before the league started up? He asked. Nah, I told him. Then how did you do it? In the gym, each player only mentioned his name once. He was staring me down for a real answer. I don't know, I answered. I wasn't going to tell him that I study people, their names and faces, mannerisms and gestures, jewelry and possessions. Cuts and bruises? I wasn't going to admit that I am a ninja who is always anticipating an attack. Why should I tell him? Sensei taught me that there is an art to concealing my weapons. I could see now that my mind, my memory, and my observations are weapons too. Rethinking the moment, maybe I shouldn't have exposed my weapons to Vega just to win his little punk-ass $20. Maybe I alerted him and caused him to pay closer attention to me in the future. Chapter 22 My schedule now was tighter than it had ever been before. I realized that being happy about the $10,000 wedding commission Uma and I had headed our way was only one level. The next level was the doubling, tripling, and quadrupling of our workload, Uma's and mine. I spent my days doing several more deliveries than ever before. I was traveling to new, faraway routes like Mount Vernon and even New Rochelle. I encountered new businesses and new business people. Orders had to be placed, tents rented, painters hired. I even ended up at a midtown Manhattan music store renting band equipment for a request the wedding party made. I had to go deep into Brooklyn to locate the tambour and the luka drums that are specific to the Sudan. Even our Sunday family days were being consumed, with all of us working side by side for that money. Naja was a polite part-time receptionist on the Uma Designs phone. She also was becoming skilled at mixing oils exactly how Uma taught her and preparing the elixirs for the crystal bottles. Squeezing in dojo practice, weapons training, basketball practice, and keeping up with homeschool work. It was looking real tight on me, spending time with Akemi, but I was thinking about her five or six times every day. Determined, I doubled up my efforts on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Even on Wednesday, the day me and her were going to get together, my feet were moving fast on the pavement early that morning so that by the time I met up with her, I wouldn't be focused on unfinished business. Her eyes slowed me down and softened me. This was our truest form of communication. Today, there was no more winter whip or frost in the air, only a subtle wind. Coats were out and sweaters, hoodies, and long-sleeved t-shirts were in. It was March 21st, the first day of spring. I could see that she had also used her time well. She seemed real relaxed. Her skin and hair glistened. She was wearing a cantaloupe-colored jumper. It was a loose fit, not hugging or riding the curves of her shapely petite body. It looked fashionable, but was too short. 
She had her legs covered with tights, colored several psychedelic shades of tangerine, a style only an artist type would find and choose to wear. She had her little feet tucked into a cremsicle colored pair of pumas, a color I'd never seen before. Foreign kicks. Her Vuitton knapsack was riding on the back. The burnt orange leather straps, brand new, hadn't darkened yet. Her pretty neck was out, no jewels on her hands, and she had only the slightest tip of each of her fingernails painted in a sparkling orange polish with the rest of the nails left natural. Her hair was worn in a stylish side slipknot. As she my smile faded away and my mood changed, which she noticed immediately. She slung her knapsack to the front and rifled through it, pulling out another folded paper, handing it to me. It was a flyer for the Cherry Blossom Festival, a Japanese cultural celebration of the arrival of the first day of spring. The paper boasted Japanese foods, Japanese drummers, and a Japanese kabuki theater group in the Brooklyn Park. I took a map from her and pointed out a different location. Central Park, located on 59th and Broadway in Manhattan. A park that, from what I knew, every female couldn't help but love. Taking over, I grabbed her hand and pulled her along. She came easily. On the train, I sat her by the window on the inside of me. She placed her little foot right beside my foot, which looked so much larger than hers in comparison. My mind drifted from the light and simple, fresh, citrus, clean scent of Akami skin to that cold night in the Brooklyn bush at Prospect Park. Clearly, I recall the image of the bullets rearranging the slow, confident, yet crooked swagger of Gold Star Tafari. The blast brought his bent style to attention before he folded and dropped down. It was my last memory of what was a gigantic and wondrous park, miles and miles of natural beauty and public peace and privacy that sometimes made it okay to live in Brooklyn. Now, there were real reasons why I stayed away from that place. I had read in a magazine once, while chilling in the Open Mind bookstore, that the police expect and wait for a shooter to return to the scene of a takedown. The author of the article said that the police experts guarantee that guilt will bring every criminal back to the scene of his crime. The writer told the story of a case where a woman was strangled to death in her suburban home. After the murder, the police on the case would drive through her residential area daily, just knowing that the guilty person would fit the formula and return to the scene. One day, on a random drive down the victim's block, a young kid came through zigzagging and popping wheelies on his bicycle. The officer driving the police cruiser waved him over. Casually, the kid rode over, smiling and innocent. While he chatted with the cop, he rested his left hand on the roof of the cruiser. How come you're not wearing your bicycle helmet? The officer asked him. Because I'm good on my bike. Didn't you see me? Now the kid extended his arms, balancing himself on his bike, his feet on the pedals, yet standing still. He smiled with great confidence. I can even do a somersault on this thing. Watch! The kid rode off and started showing off his miraculous bike tricks. The cop gave him the thumbs up, and his partner even applauded. Next, they drove straight off to the lab and had the roof of their cruiser where the kid had inadvertently placed his hand dusted for fingerprints. According to the cops, the lab, and the magazine article, the kid was the killer. The jury convicted him, and the judge sentenced him to enough years so that no one would recognize him upon his release. He was a popular junior high schooler. The victim was his teacher, who chose to embarrass and expose him in front of his classmates instead of privately encouraging him to do better. Her constant demands for him to conform and comply with her irrigated his gangster. He would have gotten away with it. One stupid error, placing one hand on the roof of the police car, got him caught. 
I learned from reading the details of that article to never return to a scene of a takedown. And I didn't and wouldn't. It was easy for me, though. I didn't feel no guilt. There was no crime scene, and Gold Star Tafari was no victim. I realized from living on my Brooklyn block that boys and even men in America expected and allowed strangers and motherfuckers to threaten and fuck with and play with their mothers, sisters, and women. They allowed other men to make false promises, to impregnate them, to make them cry, and sometimes to even kick, slap, and beat them. Back where I come from, we don't. Akemi was staring into my face almost nose to nose, eyes to eyes, and lips to lips. She snapped her fingers to break me out of my spell. Softly, she said, Hey. I came back from the hot spot where my anger stored and let her capture my attention once again. She wasn't the only one who showed up for our date with a plan. I had places to take her, things to show her, all mapped out in my mind. A little while later, her orange fingernail tips were pressed against the glass walls on the 102nd floor of the Empire State Building. Her eyes were looking down on the whole of New York City. Her face was filled with amazement. We were 1,500 feet in the air. Still, she stood on her tiptoes. When finally her eyes had surveyed enough, she turned back toward me and flashed a natural smile across her face. Kneeling down, she unbuckled her knapsack. I thought maybe she would pull out a camera like most of us who weren't born here would. Instead, she stood up holding a pencil and an unlined index card. Her pencil point was already gliding and sketching out something. Everyone else up here had cameras, small ones, Kodak disposables, expensive Nikons, various sized lenses, even zoom lenses. Akimi didn't seem to care for photography, I thought. She seemed to prefer capturing the details of what she felt and saw with her handmade, hand-drawn, or hand-painted pictures. I was impressed now that I saw her creating with a pencil her own styled postcards. Giving her space and time, I stepped back, pulling my book out of my jacket pocket and picking up reading where I left off last. Instinctively, I leapt up when I noticed a man aiming his lens at Akami's face. By the time he pressed and clicked, he had nothing but a photo of my palm print. Jesus Christ, you messed up my shot, he grimaced. Keep it moving, I warned him quietly. She's my girl. No photos. I blocked his view while using my peripheral to keep track of the Empire security guard fidgeting on my left side. Let me ask her, the tall white guy photographer in the ball buster dirty jeans pushed. Before anything else could be said or done, Akami screamed out, Alma! She gave him a flash of that spicy anger she gave me the other week outside of Cho's store. Her shriek brought security over. All of the tourists stared our way. Immediately, Akami extended her arm and pointed out the white guy. The security guard told the photographer, The young lady said no. Leave her alone. Pissed, the photographer repositioned himself to click photos of something that couldn't holler back. On the elevator ride down, she stood behind me in the corner. I was the wall between her and the people packed and pressed into one another in a limited space. On the ground floor, we both stepped into the same triangle out of the revolving door. Outside, we can breathe more easily. Suddenly, the photographer reappeared. Listen, friend, he said, extending his hand, his business card dangling from his fingers. You got me wrong. I'm willing to pay you for her photos. She's a beautiful girl, and I work for... I grabbed Akami, and we disappeared into the crowded New York City streets. I wondered to myself why no man in this country understood how to pull himself back when it came to women. 
I was sure now that many men would be murdered easily because of this problem that they saw as being nothing. An image of me poking one of the blades of my kunai into that photographer's temple flashed before me. I was glad that in this instance I had the opportunity to walk away. Music surrounded Central Park. I could hear some African drumming coming from inside, the beats grabbing my attention and arousing my soul. With a closer listen, it sounded like the rhythms of someone lost. Every tap of the skins sounded like a question. I could tell that the drummer was an amateur, but still, every drum beat is telling, saying, or showing something. Outside the park, there were sounds battling one another. Radio, speakers, amplifiers, breakdancers, rollerbladers, roller skaters, musical gymnasts, silver-skinned human robots, people, monkeys, birds, you name it. We willingly walked in and up the winding paths that seemed to turn everyone inside the park into characters and scenery, from a colorful and elaborate children's pop-up storybook, the kind I purchased for nausea a couple of years ago. Stinking horses trotted by, dragon Cinderella carts loaded down with ripped-off tourists. The animals looked exhausted, unable to see to their left or their right. They only expressed themselves by dropping huge, funky, f***ing piles of shit everywhere they went. But the newly leafed and budded crabapple trees, maple and elm trees, and even cherry blossoms, along with the makeshift waterfalls and fountains, made it into a paradise. Watching Akami. I could tell that this park had the magic that cast a spell on females. Seeing a set of swings, she took off running and jumped right on. Her legs lifted her higher and higher. Her eyes were shut. Her mouth dropped open. Her head tipped back. She leaned backward and was soaring. Like an acrobat, she suddenly stood up on the silver swing seat, pumping her legs and flying higher. In midair, she jumped off and landed right on me. I seen she liked to live dangerously. What if, in a split second, I had moved? Luckily, I didn't. She wrapped her legs around my waist and laid her breast pressed against my chest. Now her head lay on my shoulders. Her slip knot came loose and her hair brushed against my neck and fell onto my back. I carried her up the hill and down again, feeling and knowing only one thing. I had f***ed around and fell in love. By the Central Park Loeb Boathouse, I paid for a rowboat ride. Rowing on the 15 feet of man-made lake water, I knew this was not the yacht named Salama or a Falooka. It wasn't the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean. In fact, it was not a river or a sea and definitely not the Nile, but I was rowing, and she was lying on her side, her shoes kicked off, her legs hanging off the side of the boat, each toe a different shade of orange in her strange and colorful toe tights. She was listening to jazz music on an old five-inch transistor radio she pulled out of her magician's knapsack of endless alchemy stuff. As her music played softly, I noticed that the peculiarly shaped lake was surrounded by the most beautiful willow trees. I rowed us past the other seven or eight boats to a secluded spot sheltered by the willows and near a muddy incline. When she felt the boat stop, she sat up, clicked off her radio, went back into her magic bag, and pulled out what it took me a few seconds to figure out was a mini cassette tape recorder. She stepped over and sat facing me as the boat rocked a little. She pressed record, then said softly, Please? I sat idle for about ten seconds before I said anything. I wasn't no poet. My mind started pushing together a rhyme. I wasn't no rapper either. I leaned in to be close enough to her little device. Slowly I said, I could me is a girl I met in New York City. She's from Japan, and she looks real pretty. But more than that, 
She's talented and smart. In just a couple of months, she stole my heart. But Akami remains a mystery to me. She hides me from her family. But the feelings she has for me, she can't hide. Every time I see her, it's all in her eyes. I smiled, surprised at myself. When she realized I wouldn't continue, she clicked her recorder off. In the park there were bridges with tunnels and caves beneath them, dark ones filled with nature and small creatures. We walked through one of the tunnels together. Because of the immediate switch from sunlight to darkness, all I could see in there was a silhouette of Akemi. She stopped walking midway. We were alone for a moment. Still, we could both see some more walkers approaching, less than one minute away. I could feel her hand reach up to the opening of my shirt. Her fingers began sliding across my collarbone. She moved them slowly across the width of it before she withdrew them. Then I felt both of her hands in mine. I didn't return her touches, which felt so good to me. I felt like if I started touching her, I wouldn't and couldn't stop. I was brought up not to be intimate in public. Yet, I felt mad intimate within myself. Another couple entered the tunnel. Akemi stepped away from me. I heard her click on her recorder. I never saw anyone do it before, but I guess she was recording the sounds of nature. I could hear the frogs and crickets myself. Southern Grandfather, my father's father, trained me to sit still for hours and listen to the sounds of the wilderness. Me and him weren't recording with any device except for our ears. He told me to listen so carefully that I could hear the buzz of a mosquito, the ruffling of grass, and even the winding of a serpent. Seated up high in the park on a rock, me and Akami played a crazy game of charades together. How else could we do it? We couldn't talk. She would draw a quick, simple picture of what she liked. Then she handed me a card to draw what I liked. We communicated through these pictures. Only thing was, she was a great artist. I was not. When I drew two fists on the paper to let her know I am a fighter, she looked unsure. I stood up and struck a stance and did some quick moves just for her. She clapped and smiled, delighted. I drew a basketball to let her know I liked to hoop. I drew a book, then pulled my real book out and handed it to her to let her know I liked to read. Last, I drew my version of a picture of her and flung it at her. She grabbed for it. Her face revealed that I was the worst artist of all time. She didn't get it. I pointed to her and said, I like you. She smiled and laughed. She held my drawing beside her face to show me how ridiculously off it was. Afterward, she tried to slide my ugly drawing into her knapsack, but I took it away from her and put it in my back pocket. I saw that she thought everything belonged to her. On her turn, she tried to show me about herself. She pulled out her little radio and turned it on. Suddenly, she began to dance while still sitting. You like music, I guessed. What else could she be telling me? Hi, she answered. She started moving around again. You like to dance, I called out like I was competing on the game show. Hi! She laughed. Then she jumped up and started moving her arms in a controlled motion. Her fingers closed and cupped. You're a swimmer, I said. She didn't answer. Maybe I said it in a way she couldn't get it. Swim? I said, using that one word and gesturing. Hi! She smiled. Then she dropped back down, took off her backpack, and handed it to me. Next thing I knew, she was positioning her body like a yoga guru. She struck a pose and shouted in her softest voice, Hanumasana! It looked wicked. Her legs were in a full split, and her arms were extended like a graceful ballerina. One hand pointed to the sky. She didn't seem to care one bit. She was wearing a dress. In an instant, she flowed out of this amazing position into another one. Firefly! 
she said. Both of her hands were on the rock, holding her body up in the air, and her toes pointed out. Her dress crept up her thighs. She flowed out of that pose, and in her last exhibition, she twisted herself up and said softly, Scorpion, in her sensual accent. I looked at her. She was even more strange to me now and even more beautiful. She lay down, relaxing on the rock and facing the sky, plucking small leaves and sticks off her dress. I faced east and made my prayer, first cleaning my face and hands and nose and feet as is required, using bottled water. Some Ghanaians recruited me into a game of soccer on the field. I wasn't going to play. I was into something else right then. Akami tried to encourage me by playing and pushing me with her body, then her hands to go ahead. So I agreed. She watched intensely from the sidelines, along with some females who were there with the Ghanaians. I caught her eyes moving across the field with me. I felt good that she wasn't one of these girls with wandering eyes. This was actually the first game of soccer I had played since arriving in America. It took a lot more coordination than basketball. After I warmed up, I played a good game. My eyes and my feet are quick anyway. Watching the West Africans move with such passion and enthusiasm, I got into it. It was easy to look into one or two of their faces and to imagine I was seeing my father and his friends. More than that, it was relaxing to burn off the energy that had me exploding before I ran into them. Coming off the field after the game, I didn't see Akami. I gave the players a pound and a couple of them my Uma Designs business cards. I walked around slowly. I stopped, figuring she wouldn't have wandered off this far. Then I heard her laugh. I followed the direction of her laugh. I followed the direction of her voice and saw her enjoying watching me look for her as she sat comfortably in a tree. Why bother trying to figure out how she got up there? Or why? I stood below her, and she came leaping down into my arms. She placed her nose against my neck, sniffing the scent of my sweat. We both used our hands to brush each other off. I pulled a leaf and a couple of hits of bark off her. I even took some particles off her pretty stockings. So nicely dressed when we first started out, we were both looking like we had a mad and crazy good time. Seated in the Middle Eastern restaurant called Medina Star, on the east side of 57th Street in Manhattan, I was sure I was introducing Akemi to some of the North African foods that I enjoy, which she had probably never tried. I ordered falafel with tahini sauce, hummus, and baba ganoush. I ordered those purple Kalamata olives that I enjoy with cayenne spiced onions and shata. I also ordered a tray of chicken kebabs and warm pita bread, all of it for us to share. When she returned from the ladies' room, all fresh and clean, her eyes danced at the spread on our table. She began trying each dish, her reaction showing up on her face each time. I picked up her mini recorder from her side of the table. She was just sucking one of her fingers when I clicked it on and said, Speak Korean. Every other word dragged out. The syllables moaned instead of spoken. The way she spoke it was erotic, and it was nice, too. Speak Chinese, I said next. Her watery eyes dried up. I saw she was delighted by games. She spoke some Chinese to me, which sounded nothing like her Japanese or Korean. It was a swiftly spoken language with a nasal twang. Last, I asked her to speak Thai, and she did easily. Secretly, I was overwhelmed by her. In the night, she wanted to shop. She was the first person ever to take me into Berghoff Goodman, which had to be the most expensive store in the whole wide world. 
I watched her drown herself in perfumes, checking on me what scents I liked. She looked at thousand dollar dresses, shoes that cost several thousand dollars, and handbags so expensive they were locked in the vault. From Bergdorf's, she ended up only purchasing a couple of things. A pair of Prada kicks and seven pairs of stockings, beautiful and fancy ones. By now, I could see that colorful stockings and textured tights was really her thing. Afterward, she wanted to show me something else. We walked about 12 blocks before we arrived at a brick building on a side street. She pushed through the glass door and led me up six flights of narrow stairs to the third floor. Up there were walls and walls and shelves of books, volumes of graphic novels, comics, and magazines. Catch was, everything was written in Japanese. I figured she wanted me to know that she liked books too, and what kind. I figured the woman asked, is this black guy with you, or should I call the police? After a while... I figured out that Akami shopped there because they had the styles that fit Asian girls. Their body type was different from a lot of other women. These shops catered to them and also sold both the European and Asian high fashions in petite sizes. Akami took forever and then dropped a couple of grand on some items she selected in the 13th Street shops. Despite the cost, all of her purchases fit into two decorative shopping bags, which she unfolded from inside her magical knapsack. On 34th Street, a huge crowd had gathered on either side of the long blocks. I was surprised. There were hundreds or maybe even a thousand people standing there side by side and back to back. When I looked up at the glowing numbers on the neon clock that sat in the billboard in the sky, I was surprised at just how late it was. Even Macy's department store had already closed. Police officers lined each side of the street keeping the crowd behind the barricades and keeping the streets clear. Akami walked behind me with one hand on my waist. When I found our way through to the front of the crowd, I thought I must have gone crazy because I saw 50 huge, majestic elephants marching down the New York City streets, single file in a straight line. Akimi, standing behind me, could not see. I took her two shopping bags and secured them. I lifted her onto my shoulders, her legs dangling down on my chest. It's the Ringling Brothers and Bonham and Bailey Circus. They're bringing the elephants into Madison Square Garden. It's circus season, one parent explained to her teenage kids. It's the Midnight March of the Elephants. They do this every year, another person said. Akimi wouldn't move until the last elephant, clown, monkey, horse, and pony trotted off the streets. She was so fascinated, I didn't move her or remind her that now it was the next day, 12.30 a.m. When our cab arrived at Jackson Heights, Queens, she wanted to walk off on her own toward her house. I paid the cabbie and went with her, not trying to hear no sayonara. I wouldn't leave her to go alone at this late hour. I walked with her right up to her front door. Their porch light was high intensity, high wattage, more like a searchlight, and was the only light on the very darkened street. Her auntie pulled their door open slightly, as though she had been seated right there on the other side of the door just waiting. I said, good night, to the both of them and made my way home. For me, it was cool walking the late night, early morning streets of Queens, New York. I could feel the love moving and spreading through my chest like an invasion. It was a new feeling, different from my love for my family. It was a good feeling, too. On the train, tempted to assure myself of a couple of things. Akami was on break from school, so it was all right for her to be out late with me tonight. But I knew that wasn't true. It wasn't all right in my beliefs and traditions. 
None of it was supposed to be happening. But what was up with her uncle anyway? I had introduced myself properly to him. I handed over the modest gifts from my family to his. I told where I worked and where I came from. I was up front with him, but he was silent. If he had anything to say or any rules to set or any demands to make, the ball was in his court. I could respect any man who made himself clear about his family. At our apartment, I got some responses from Akami's family. It came on my voicemail while I was listening to a few business messages at a low volume in my bedroom. The first call came from the night before at 9 while we were out shopping. It was Akami's cousin looking for Akami. Oddly, her message was spoken as if she wasn't the one who called me and set up the date between me and Akami in the first place. She was talking like she had no idea what was going on or even if she was calling the right number. She was speaking as if she was unsure if Akami was even with me. I replayed it twice. I paused it. I decided maybe their uncle leaned on her about Akami's whereabouts, and she pretended not to know where Akami was, but still she called around searching. I wasn't sure about my theory, though. Her second voicemail came in at around 10.30. This is Akami's cousin. My mother would like to invite you to our home tomorrow at 1 in the afternoon. She would like to meet you. Akami knows where we live. If you agree, she will meet you tomorrow at... I will definitely show up. I could tell that now they were becoming more aware and interested in who I am and what I am involved in. I knew that them calling me over to their house was a chance for the adults on Akami's side to take a closer look. All I knew was that I am a real man who is trying my best to be respectful of them. Later that morning, I woke up hard as steel and remained that way for a while. By 10 a.m., I was freshly showered and dressed and standing outside the door of a Brooklyn wholesale flower shop named Tropics. I had some Uma Designs business to take care of, an expensive order of thousands of flowers for the Sudanese wedding. This was the only flower wholesaler in my area that carried flowers imported from African countries as well as flowers from all over the world, including Hawaii, Thailand, Brazil, Argentina, and so on. Besides, they boasted a money-back guarantee on the freshness of their product. But I didn't want my money back. I just needed them to get the job done right the first time. There would be no do-overs, take-backs, or second chances on the wedding. I placed my order precisely as Uma had described it to me. The thousands of fresh flowers would arrive on the morning of the wedding. I had an idea to double-check their business credibility. I put together an exotic flower arrangement and ordered it to be delivered to Akami's family shop next week. I knew she might like these unusually beautiful and unique types of flowers that I selected for her. Perhaps her aunt and uncle would too. I would also get a chance to see if the flowers were delivered on time, if they were fresh and the exact arrangement that I had ordered. By 11 a.m., I was in Manhattan at a candy wholesaler named Sweeties. I took my time looking at tons of candies and order sheets for exactly what Uma wanted. By 1 p.m., I was all the way on the west side of Lower Manhattan to meet Akami by the river as agreed, farther west than I ever had walked or traveled in NYC before. Akami was there waiting. She held up two tickets in her hand. She was good luck for me, I thought. Once again, I found myself in the boat, a ferry speeding across the Hudson River. Yesterday, a lake. Today, a river. Tomorrow, maybe, she and I would be in the yacht of my dreams, moving on the deep blue waters of the ocean. My ticket said Edgewater, New Jersey, and script across the bottom of the ticket was the slogan, New Jersey, the Garden State. As we rode side by side, she had her hand on my leg, playing with fire. She wore a blue denim dress with the back out, 
It was covered only by strips of straps crisscrossing each other while exposing the beauty and curve of her back. She wore a pair of blue leather gladiator sandals that crisscrossed up her pretty, shapely bare legs, which I was seeing now for the first time. It was too much. She seemed as if she felt cold. The breeze on the river much stronger with more chill than on the warm spring streets of New York. I took off my jacket and covered her legs. Since I wore a t-shirt beneath it, I unbuttoned my denim shirt, took it off, and put it on her instead. It was way too big for her pretty shoulders, but it did enough to satisfy me. She leaned against me, staring off to the other side of the river, whispering, but seeming trapped somewhere in her imagination. There was not a large crowd getting off the ferry in Edgewater, a small town really on the edge, etched out between the river and the mountains. I followed her. Soon we were boarding their version of the Brooklyn Dollar Van. We jumped in and stood right next to each other for the short ride to an unfamiliar market. The place was called Mitsua. It was a huge complex framed by boutiques on one side and a Japanese restaurant called Masushima that sat further back on the Hudson River. It had an authentic old Asian architecture, a design I had seen once in the film. Inside the market, the aroma of fresh baked breads and pastries filled the air. Strangely, there were several separate businesses within the supermarket, open stall bakeries, tea shops, spaghetti stands, and cafes. There was a huge seating area, high ceilings, and expensive benches and stools and chairs, not in straight rows, but arranged like a jigsaw puzzle for small or big families and groups of customers to enjoy. The grocery shopping section was well stocked and immaculate. Akemi grabbed the cart and began shopping. She looked at me before she pushed off, saying only one word. Cook. As we maneuvered through the vegetables and fruits, many of which I never knew even existed, she pointed them out and recited their Japanese names. When I saw items that I recognized, I told her the English translation for those too. With two sacks of groceries, we walked out the side door, a different door than the one we entered. We stood in front of one of the boutiques, and the Mitsua minibus arrived. We boarded a bus full of Asians, each one shorter and smaller than myself. The driver sped up a winding road named River Road. I kept my eyes on the street signs because I always need to know where I'm at, how I traveled in, and how to travel the f*** back out. Soon we were riding over the overpass to the George Washington Bridge. We entered a town called Fort Lee and climbed off. There were taxis there. We caught one. Akemi gave the street number and name, nothing more, nothing less. We traveled through expensive apartment complexes with terraces and beautiful wooded areas and flowered paths. Soon we were weaving in and out of weirdly shaped and placed streets and alcoves past mansions separated by acres, fences, tall trimmed and manicured bushes, and swimming pools. The driver asked for nine fifty. I paid him and asked, What town is this? He looked at me through his rear view first, then turned his head all the way around. Englewood Cliffs, he said dryly. We were at a dead end marked with two street signs. One said, Honeysuckle Courtyard. The other sign read, No Exit. It was a cul-de-sac, lined with a semicircle of cherry blossom trees. Akami walked a pathway to one mansion whose front lawn was a rock garden instead of grass. Each rock was carefully placed in the pattern. There were a few circular slabs of cement that served as a hopscotch path leading up to a bench oddly placed underneath their one beautiful purple-leafed plum tree. Zooming out of their long driveway backward was an olive-green Range Rover. Akemi stopped walking and watched it pull off and away. She looked at me as if she wanted to say something that she couldn't express. 
The bell chimed, and it seemed that the sound was being amplified throughout their house and property. Soon her cousin opened the heavy and obviously expensive designer door. Rapidly, she began speaking in their language to Akemi. Then she turned to me. Come on in. Welcome to my house, she said happily. Where are your parents? I asked her instinctively while removing my kicks, which I knew was customary. Oh, yeah. Well, my mother is the one who really wanted to meet you, but she just rushed off to the hospital, the cousin said, placing my kicks onto a shoe rack. I'm sorry. Is she sick? I asked. The cousin laughed. No, silly. She's a surgeon, and her beeper went off. She hated to leave. She wanted to be here, but she had to go. And your father? I asked. Where I come from? When you enter a home, you're supposed to be greeted by the man of the house. If not, you seek him out and offer him greetings when you locate him. Akemi exhaled, took the two Mitsua bags from my hands, and strolled off somewhere. The cousin said, Let me show you around and introduce you to my brothers and their friends. The house was extremely clean and not overcrowded with ugly furniture. There was mostly woodwork and steel benches instead of chairs, wide corridors and high ceilings, good air circulating, open spaces and tall walls of windows, marble floors and granite counters, beds in the bedrooms lower to the floor. There was a wide selection of artwork on the walls. There were several big rooms, nicely designed. I could tell her cousin wanted me to be impressed. I was but I had owned and lived in much more back home, better and higher quality, sitting on much more land. I knew there was a huge difference between a home and an estate. Besides, I was here because Akemi was here, and this was her family, and that was it. It could have been a tiny cabin. If Akemi was going to be there, I would have showed up there too. So far, there was no trace of her brothers. I could see that this was where the real living took place. There was a greenhouse filled with plants, a small tree, and flowers, and one old lady wearing a bizarre bamboo hat. She's my grandmother, the one who I told you doesn't speak any English, was how Akemi's cousin decided to describe her. But we didn't go inside the greenhouse to meet her grandmother properly. Of course their basketball court caught my eye. That's where her brothers were, off to the side, getting a game on when we walked up. She introduced us. Hiro and Kano-san, this is Akami's friend Midnight. Akami says to treat him like a king. She told them, laughed a little, then left. Both brothers looked me over, gave me a pound, and introduced me to their two friends, two white boys. One was named Rob, the other one Dave. Both of them gave me friendly greetings. I don't know why, but as soon as I stepped up, they all forgot about the game they were playing and handed me the ball. I took a few shots, all net. They kept passing the ball back to me. They talked about the New York Knicks and the New Jersey Nets. The guy Dave said his father got season passes to the Knicks and they went to the games at the Garden all the time. Hito asked me, Tell us. How did you meet my cousin Akemi? I work in Chinatown. That's really cool, Kano said, and Hito agreed. Just as things was flowing easy, the kid Rob, who I figured was about 17 years young or so, said some slick sh** to me. So you're dating Akemi. You're lucky, man. I've been trying to talk to her ever since I first met her a few months back. I ended up with nothing. He was smiling and holding his arms stretched apart as though he couldn't understand his failure to attract her. You want to run one? I asked him. Who, me? He said, just like a coward. Yeah, you and me. One on one. I threw the ball at him. Jack, I said. The other three backed off the court. I humiliated him. I never let him shoot the ball. I smacked down all of his shots as soon as he tried to put them up. I stripped him, made him run around, chasing the ball he could not see or catch. I knocked him over, then stuck my hand out to help him up. At 18 points to zero, he got tired of the beating 
and begged enough. I gave him a pound and said with a smile, Good game, man. His friends tried to hold it back, but they ended up laughing at him and looking at me with amazement. It was not like I felt good about it. It was easy for me to dominate them on the court, even without my kicks on. Just then, I noticed Akemi watching me through a window. Then, I couldn't see her anymore. I thought to myself, it's bitch for people who can't play the game and don't love the game to have season tickets. Meanwhile, in our hoods, the game is pumping through our veins and living in our hearts, yet most will never get to go to the garden, much less sit in the seats right on the floor. Let's get some waters, Kano said. We all follow him to his kitchen. He grabbed the waters from a stainless steel refrigerator that was filled with bottled waters. He tossed them across the room to each of us. I finished off mine and asked for the bathroom. Hito pointed the way, which I remembered anyway, from their sister's tour. I washed my hands and face in a sink shaped like a large dish. It was made of marble. I stood still a moment, thinking. When I returned to the kitchen, Akemi and her cousin were standing there. For some reason, the dude Rob was in the kitchen too, even though Hito, Kano, and Dave had moved on. He said to me, You was gone a long time, and smiled slyly. Rob was one of those dudes who could never survive in Brooklyn. The type who never learns how to play his position and shut the f*** up until he's bleeding from the mouth. He was their guest, yet he carried himself like he was the man of the house, having too many words to say about every small or large situation. Akemi pulled me out of where my energy was moving. I followed her to the other side of the backyard, up some stone steps, and into a private area under a trellis. There were vines and plants hanging down from overhead, and on three sides, plants made walls where there really were none. Only one side remained open and was clear to see in and out. It was breezy. Akemi had the small barbecue going. She had sliced and placed chunks of salmon on sticks with onions and green peppers with seasonings. She was turning the sticks now, but I could tell they were cooked and ready. The outdoor table was arranged with love. There were miniature dishes of sauces and spices carefully placed. There were green porcelain rectangular plates of varying sizes, a table offering salads and vegetables and steaming brown rice in a rice cooker. There were two black metal kettles, one filled with soup, the other with tea. After I looked at everything, I looked at her. She was waiting for my reaction. I smiled and then sat. She smiled, relaxed, and served. The spoons and even her maroon-glazed wooden chopsticks were beautiful. It was a table with nothing ordinary to offer. I could tell she wasn't sure what I would eat, so she had prepared a lot of simple but thoughtful choices. I liked it all. Her fingers wrapped around her chopsticks, her nails today were clean, with only a coat of transparent gloss. She stared at me while she chewed. Her stupid transistor radio was playing piano tunes. Her taste in music was obviously diverse, same as my father's. The meal she served didn't weigh me down. It was light and satisfying. Afterward, I pulled out my candles and spread about nine of them across her table and pointed for her to choose one. I wanted to know what kind of flavor she liked. She picked them up one by one and looked each of them over, but didn't select. I opened the Hershey's Kiss and held it to her mouth. Then she went through each of the eight pieces of candy and licked each one, sucking her own tongue afterward to bring down the flavor. I guess she was looking for the right taste, but at the same time, she was driving my blood up. She licked the caramel twice, but settled on the honey. She took it in her mouth and kept it. She took my hand. She said one word. Go. I think she meant come. 
I picked up the caramel candy that she had licked. Caramel had always been my first choice. I followed her. We stepped around the trellis. She disappeared into a path behind it and into the woods behind her cousin's home. We walked for about six and a half minutes before I saw an easel and a chair off to my left. I realized she must come out here sometimes to paint. I could see why. There was nothing out there but the beauty and sounds of nature. No humans, except for us. Surprisingly, she turned to the right, walking away from the easel. She stopped in front of an old oak tree with deep roots, a huge wide trunk, and branches that stretched to the sky forever. The new spring leaves were every shade of green. She leaned up against the tree. She locked her eyes onto mine. She started speaking Japanese to me. She placed her palms underneath my t-shirt. When her skin touched my skin, my whole body heated up. I stepped into her. I put my hands on her shoulders, then moved them down her bare arms. She caught goosebumps and began breathing intensely. I locked my fingers into hers. She brought both our hands up to her breasts. She unraveled her fingers from mine, then dropped her hands to her sides. My hands were still there on her breasts, the size of mangoes. I began to caress and gently squeeze. Her raised up through the denim. She breathed even louder. I leaned in and kissed her, still touching her cetus. It was lips to lips at first. Little by little, her mouth opened. She licked my lip. My tongue found her tongue. She began sucking my tongue like she wanted to have all of the caramel for herself. Like she wanted to consume me inside of her mouth. It felt so good. I picked her up to hold her closer to my body, to feel her. Eye to eye, I held her in my arms, her butt seated in my hands, her back up against a tree, her bare legs wrapped around my waist. She rubbed my head. Even my scalp was on fire. She touched my face, my chin, my neck. I began sucking her neck. She started moaning softly. Soon she was back to suck on me too. Her body gave in to the feeling. The taut grip of her legs loosened. Soon enough we were both on the ground, her legs slightly open in a short blue denim dress. Her chest heaved up and down like she just completed a strenuous marathon. She sat up pulled her body to the tree and leaned up against it. I sat up beside her. We tried our best to slow it down, but she took my hand back into her hand. She was massaging my fingers. I ran my other hand up the inside of her thigh. I had never felt anything so soft and so good. Her cheeks were flushed and her eyes were so excited, wide and beautiful. Her left leg was shaking some. I couldn't believe the power of my touch, but her breathing and moaning made it true. Under her dress, I could feel her panties. They were the only thing that separated me from her b which I could feel raised up through the very thin material. I didn't try to pull them off. I just touched the outside, rolled the contour of her body with my fingers, Gently exploring, her moistness soaked through almost immediately. She whispered only one word. Please. Her legs dropped open now completely. I imagined like a beginner's yoga position. Both my hands were raising up her thighs, holding her hips. Soon, I was holding her small, bare waist in my hands. But before I could slide her panties down, we both heard her cousin's voice screaming out her name.
Her cousin's voice interrupted something so sweet and powerful and yanked me out of the momentum of something so new and so incredible. Reluctantly, I stood up and held out my hand so that she could grab onto me and hurry and get up too. Ak and me tried to pull me closer onto her. She didn't want me to stop. I definitely didn't want to stop either, but her cousin's voice was drawing closer. Her cousin shouted out some words in Japanese. Akimi answered back in Japanese. She turned around and said, Go! I knew she meant come. I jogged behind her the seven minutes back to her house. In the cool corridor of the house, her cousin was looking both of us over. The light was dim, but even I noticed the purple passion mark I left on Akimi's neck. I wanted everybody else and everything else to disappear for a while. Then I would pursue my passions and put my marks all over Akimi's body. Instead, I took a deep breath and looked away from my attraction. Her and Akimi kept talking back and forth. The telephone rang. Her cousin looked at her and without words, her eyes instructed Akimi to answer the phone. Akimi picked up the telephone. Her voice switched into respect mode. I could tell she was speaking to an elder. Her cousin was standing by me. It's our uncle calling, she said. This is his second call, she added. Is something wrong, I asked, completely out of guilt. A leaf from the woods fell off Akami's dress and came zigzagging down onto the marble floor. No, it's just that our uncle is responsible for Akami. He is both of our father's youngest brother. Looking very disappointed, Akimi hung up the phone and began speaking to her cousin. Her cousin interpreted for me. Our uncle says that Akimi cannot have a guest in our house if neither my mother or father are home, the cousin announced. I tried to explain to my uncle that mom was supposed to be here and that she should return soon enough. But our uncle said that this is no good because when he called the first time, Hiro cannot even find you and Akimi. It's no problem. I'll get ready to leave, I said. Ask Akemi for my jacket, I told her cousin. She translated. Akemi says come and get it, her cousin informed me. As Akemi walked down the corridor, then up three indoor stairs, turning into a bedroom, I followed her easily. But her cousin also followed me. In the bedroom, she picked my jacket up from the bed and handed it to me. The look in her eyes was too powerful. But I could also feel her cousin's eyes burning a hole in my back to hurry up and leave. I took the jacket and turned to go. Akemi spoke to her cousin. Her cousin said to me, Akemi says she's coming with you. Looking at her cousin instead of her, I answered, Tell Akemi I said to stay here. I don't want to cause any more trouble with your uncle. You tell her. She's a rebel. She won't listen. Her cousin said, then translated. Akemi checked my eyes to see if I refused her coming. I shook my head no to show her she could not come with me. She pouted and folded her arms over her chest. Her cousin said, That's better anyway. Akemi staying over here in Jersey for the next week instead of being at home alone in Queens. Uncle said so. Is she working at the store? My older brother is home from college for the week. He's working at Uncle's store. Akemi will be right here with me. Until? Until her vacation ends. One week, she'll return to Queens on next Sunday. Akemi was leaning against the wall, looking mad and even more pretty. Before I put my sneakers back on, I asked about Hito and Kano. They're in the basement, her cousin said. She led me to the basement door. Hito! Kano! I'm about to bounce. Good meeting you two, I said. Later, man, they both said. Then Rob and Dave yelled up, Later, dude! They would have come upstairs to say bye, but they're playing video games. You know how it is, her cousin said. I walked to their front door, pulled my sneakers off the rack, put them on. Jamata Hakimi, I said. It meant, I'll see you next time. It was a long walk to the nearest bus stop. I kept my pace swift. Didn't want to inspire any policemen, although I had not seen any so far. The sun was warm and bright. 
There was nothing but peace and solitude. The trees swayed and the birds were busy. I could see why they called this the Garden State. After a trek, there were several buses headed right over the George Washington Bridge. It was the quickest way for me to get back into the city. I decided to save the ferry boat rides for me and her. I jumped on the bus instead. Seated in the back window seat, I pressed my head against the glass. As the bus pulled off, I could see Akamese pedaling fast on the boy bike she must have borrowed from her boy cousins. She was wearing a sweater, a t-shirt, and capris, and kicks now. Her hair was in a wild, long ponytail. She was covered with a light sheen of perspiration and looking all around for me. Allah is good, I thought. Akimi could not see me, and it was too late for me to get off the moving bus. I knew if I were to encounter her again today, there would be no stopping the momentum of our feelings. The scent of her was still on my fingers. I had no desire to remove it. It made me feel as if my hand were still moving up the inside of her soft as butter thigh. The scent enticed me almost as much as she did. I couldn't think straight, at least not as straight as I usually could. This day had been a series of firsts. First time to New Jersey. First time being inside of Akami's family home. First time sliding my tongue into a mouth. First time running my hands over a female's breasts and thighs and touching her panties. First time I felt like something felt so good that I couldn't stop myself. I knew I had to sort it all out. But for now, I did something I never do while traveling or standing still in the streets of Brooklyn. I closed my eyes. Chapter 23 Fresh. I was fresh when I picked up Uma from work. Still, I imagined she could see Akami's passion prints all over me like a purple ultraviolet light exposes lint on clothing that the naked eye cannot see. But she didn't say one word differently than she usually would when I met her in the early evening. Let's get a cab instead, she said. I have the address of an Egyptian jeweler. His jewels come very highly recommended. On the ride over, Uma explained... I want you to convince the jeweler to agree to a private showing of his bangle collection at the executive apartment of the father of the groom. The father and his son, the groom, will be certain to select something exquisite for the bride. Turned out that the groom's father, whom Uma never spoke to directly, is an important Sudanese dignitary. He would arrive in New York tonight from Switzerland. His business this upcoming week would require his presence at the United Nations. He could accept a meeting with the jeweler at his Manhattan apartment across from the UN, but his schedule would not permit him to make the trip out to the various jeweler stores. Sudanese brides, Uma said, expect their bangles to be incredible. The jewels on the bride's arm on her wedding day are so much more important to her than any ring being placed on her finger. The bangles will be hers to cherish forever. And believe me, they are only a small part of the dowry that her groom must provide to her and her family. Sounds expensive, I said. These are not poor people we are working for, Uma informed me. The groom has graduated from a prestigious university in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He is working now for some U.S. corporation. His auntie told me that their nephew has gained all of the money that he ever wanted, but he had lost his tradition. Uma made a sound with her teeth, expressing how shameful she felt the loss of tradition is. Our job is to make sure that the groom and his family, who have been living in Europe and America for all these years, are properly prepared for his wedding to a northern Sudanese Muslim woman whose Sudanese family will expect a traditional Sudanese wedding and will be completely insulted by anything else. We stood outside the Egyptian jeweler's door. A big sign in the window read, Open. The lighting inside the store was bright, yet the door was locked. An Arab woman looked at us from a distance behind the jewelry counter. 
A narrow man emerged into view and looked us over too. He walked toward the locked glass door and stood still for some seconds. You're in Brooklyn, mother first up. Open the door, I thought to myself. Who did he expect to see as his customers? My Islamic mother was standing right there, covered from head to toe. He signaled to the woman who remained behind the counter. She reached her fingers to the wall behind her and pressed the buzzer, unlocking the door. He pulled the door open before I could push it. He stood in his doorway, blocking us from entering. Are you open? Nam, he answered, which means yes in Arabic. Do you want to spend some money today? he asked us. I did not like his question. It was a subtle way of saying, do you two have any money or not? Or, why bother? We want to arrange for a private showing of your bangle collection to a dignitary from our country. I handed him our business card. Without even looking at it, he said with clever sarcasm, he can come here to the store. We will show him our collection privately. An older Arab man emerged. He was standing a few feet behind him now, watching. I assumed he was the man's father. He's an important client for our business. We need to make it convenient for him. It would be profitable business for you, too, I assured him. You won't be disappointed. The Arab stepped outside his store. The door closed and locked behind him. Uma stepped back. I remained standing there in his face. You see the pharmacy there? He pointed. Go and buy a camera and bring it. I will snap some photos of our bangle collection. You will show him and return with his money and his choices, the Arab said. Uma stood silently, listening, watching. If she were not standing here with me, I would have stopped this conversation before it ever started, before he decided after too long a wait to move closer to the door. But I wanted to please Uma. All right, if we can come in, my mother can look over the bangles. She will know the tastes of our client, I said, preferring to work it out that way. Is she buying or is he buying? The Arab said curtly. I touched Uma's arm. We turned and left. I heard him spit on the ground somewhere behind me. Running suicides at basketball practice wasn't nothing for me. I needed to do something physical and extreme to burn off my energy. So I did. After Vega's whistle, I was still running suicides. The laps Vega called for, I doubled. The drills, I drilled. I wasn't trying to impress anybody. I was trying not to kill anybody else. But the disrespect was too constant. Three hours after practice began that same night, the entire team was seated together on the gym floor, drenched in sweat. Vega wasn't sweating. He was plotting. All of you are making me look good tonight. Keep it up. We'll look good together, he said, talking fast and clapping his hands twice. For now, you need to choose a team captain, a leader, a point man. I'm going to walk away. In three minutes, when I get back at you, you all tell me who it is. Who wants to be the captain of Los Negros, Panama Black asked. So we all knew he did. Nobody was stepping up. Then the kid named Brad said, That brother right there should be our captain. Pointing at me. Nah, I'm just a shooter. Let Panama Black be the captain. He hustles hard. I'm not a leader. If I'm in the clear, feed me. I'll sink it in the hoop, all right? They all nodded their approval or said, yeah. Panama Black smiled, revealing his framed gold teeth. You know it, he said, accepting the new position. On the way out, Panama threw his arm around my shoulder and kept it there too long for me. You a cool motherfucker, he said with a straight face. Where are you from, he asked. Brooklyn, same as you, I answered. He laughed once and said, I, I hear that. He knew we were both from different countries. I was just being polite enough not to tell him to mind his f***ing business. Panama thought I was doing him a favor stepping out of his way so he could shine. I looked at it the other way around. The way I saw it, 
Vega was about to dump a heap of responsibilities on his head as team captain. Panama will have to be accountable for every player on the team, their whereabouts, and getting them to act right and show up on time. When the next player fell short, he would take the weight. I didn't have the time. For me, the league was strictly business. I was glad to give him that position and move out of the light where I preferred to be. Our team stepped out of the gym and into the red and blue lights of the popo, pulled up and parked on the curb in front of the gym. They was eyeing us with a hatred that didn't mean shit, cause it was an everyday thing. That's right. That's right. Keep walking. That's right. Keep your eyes front. Keep walking. A cop's voice blasted out over the megaphone. Keep walking. Clear the area and get back to your buildings. The voice ordered. Only one team member made the mistake of turning around and looking back toward the police cruiser. The cop on the driver's side jammed the gas pedal. The police cruiser jumped and sped up to where we were walking. One and a half seconds worth of siren rang out then stopped immediately. We're looking for a black guy in jeans and a t-shirt. Is that you? The cop asked sarcastically, throwing his voice over the megaphone from inside the cruiser. Our whole team was wearing sweats and kicks. We just kept walking, our backs to them. Vega walked with us too, toward the train station. I knew he had his reasons for walking with the team, because earlier I seen him roll up in his car, which he parked in the opposite direction. I noticed Vega wasn't saying nothing either. The cops followed us slowly, still sitting and riding behind us all the way to the station. They disappeared when they were sure we were all going down into the subway and out of their area. A black guy in jeans and a t-shirt, I thought to myself. That fits the description of every male youth in all our hoods. I had two guns, four knives, and eight hundred dollars on me that night. Close call. As if you don't already know, we gotta take a pause for a cause because I'm gonna need you folks to tune in to the next edition of Ralph Reads, where we will continue this Sister Soldier miniseries. I would like, or rather love, to thank you queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook. While you still can, send a friend request to Ralph Anthony Garcia and on Twitter and Instagram at RGMC2407. Send an email to RGMC2407 at gmail.com, where if you like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407 or cash app. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also connect with me on my my other channel at RGMC2407 and right here on TURN. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the continuation of this Sister Soldier miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Learn a thing or two and see what knowledge brings to you. Kenny and Giselle are getting married. Love you. You got one more day till your life is over. That's ball and chain. Till death. Does he not understand till death? But sometimes, love is hard. We said no kids. Do we like them? Do we not like them? How are we playing this? They're about to be family. Oh. What is wrong with y'all? Run away, bride! How far will you go for love? We said we were going to have a day without incident. Why do I have a day without something? 
Look, if you leave now, it'll look like something is wrong. Something is wrong. We have to go see what's going on. There's no way she would ever be this late. But you've been against this wedding since you got here. Did you say something to her? Make sure you're being smart about this. Somebody somehow knows something. Nobody's perfect. Where's Giselle? Aurora. A love story. Premiering January 27th.